Hi, um, I'm Debbie Smith, the moderator of the 2023 Spring Organic Landscaping Series. I want to welcome you to the second uh, 2023 Organic Landscaping Series tonight. It is a four-part program, which started in March of 2023. The programs are on the third Thursday of the month from March 2023 to June 2023 from 7 to 8.30 p.m. This month's program, we have Denise Brighton Rucker from the Mass Water Resources Authority, who, we, who will be talking about what you can do in and outside your home to protect our water supply and what concerns uh, are associated with pesticide use. If you missed the first one of the series on March 16, 2023, with Jim Agabitas from the Minuteman Landscaping, uh, he talked about how uh, do you define organic landscaping? What are the associated costs and what you can do in your home? And you can watch it on the Watertown Free Public Library's website. Next month on May 18, 2023, we will have Sarah Evans, uh, for, who's an assistant professor in the environmental medicine and public health at the Ikin School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And she's going to speak on what is the science regarding pesticide use? And what are the health concerns for pesticide use, especially for children? And the last one of the series will be on June 15th, 2023, with Chip Osborne and some community project leaders on what was done in Wellesley, Mass, to make it uh, beautiful, and also in, um, uh, in you know, up in another community uh, in Marblehead, uh, Mass. And we'll learn about um, organic public lands and current local projects. Our local Congresswoman, Emily Izzo, informed me that she received an email from Gregory uh, St. Louis, who was our superintendent of the public works in Watertown. Uh, and uh, he emailed her that uh, the DPW only uses organic methods on the public lands in Watertown. Very similar, it sounds like what uh, Jim Agabee just talked about last month. Our speaker this month co-authored a wonderful book, which is um, online, uh, is free online called A Healthy Environment Starts at Home. And she's going to show her book to us all. And I will put the link in the chat during the program. I, I in fact, I used Denise's uh, suggestions in the book recently to clear a clogged tub and didn't need to call a plumber. So I want to thank you, Denise, for co-authoring this book because it's absolutely yeah. wonderful. Denise has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in biology from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master's in Environmental Policy and Planning from Tufts uh, and her thesis was on how to develop an HHW reduction plan for the state of Massachusetts, which she's going to talk about today. Uh, her favorite seasons are summer or fall, uh, and she loves being outside and gardening. And I want to welcome Denise to the series. Denise. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Nice to nice to have nice to be had, I guess, as they say. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll I kind of uh, jump, you know, Debbie's done a great job of introducing me. Um, it sounds like we'll save questions for the end. Um, you'll see oftentimes the abbreviation HHW is household hazardous waste. I just, that's just what we get used to kind of how, how we abbreviate it. And I, it sounds like, um, and I, I did look at uh, your first speakers, uh, what, what you had recorded. I looked ahead and it's, it does seem like these will dovetail nicely. I do mention, you know, a fair amount about pesticides and, and the pesticide impact pesticide impacts, but it sounds like your next speaker is really going to get into depth about the health impacts. And I'm talking a little bit more about the environmental impacts. Um, but I'm also going to, as Deb says, I can show you the book now. We have this book. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Healthy Environment Starts at Home. We also have it in Spanish. Uh, we have a hard copy in Spanish and English. And then online, I, I'm not sure we have the Spanish copy online, but we do have the English copy free online or a hard copy from us. You'd have to contact me. Um, so I'm going to move on here. Um, and, and again, talking about starting with pesticides, but I'll also broaden this to household hazardous waste in general. Um, you know, uh, uh, pesticides is what we say. I mean, a pesticide is designed to kill a pest, right? It's designed to kill. There, you know, there's something that will cause death in some, whether it's a bug or a weed or, or something else. The problem is a lot of them are not targeted. Um, so you, you might have a pesticide that is, you know, designed to kill, um, all kinds of weeds, but it may also end up killing bees, for example, which we know are very important. We wouldn't have any food without bees. So pesticides have, and I, and I, I don't know if Jim talked about this last week, but they have an active ingredient and inert ingredients. Um, sometimes the inert ingredients can be more hazardous than act than the active ingredient. And the other thing is that they, and you'll probably hear more about this next month, but they, um, the metabolites. So when a pesticide gets into the environment, it's it's broken down maybe by 
uh, water. It could be broken down by sunlight, you know, so whatever. The problem is sometimes those metabolites are just as toxic, if not worse, than your original pesticide. And one of the best examples that you may remember, and of course now it's banned, thank goodness, but people will remember DDT, the metabolite, the breakdown of that was DDE, which was just as hazardous um, and just as toxic. So, you know, you look at it and go, well, that doesn't seem bad. And, but there's other inert ingredients that they don't always have to list that, all, that can be quite, quite uh, hazardous. Um, they can get in into the body through ingestion, inhalation, skin contact, right? You're spraying it. Um, one of the things that inhalation, you know, your neighbor sprays their yard, your windows are open in the summer, it ends up in your in your house too. So it's not, there are all kinds of ways. Obviously, you can eat food that's that or or something, you know, or, or an animal could ingest grass or something that uh, pesticides have been used on. They can, you know, kind of near and near to my heart since I work at, at the MWRA and we are, you know, we're both trying to keep the harbor clean and beautiful as well as our drinking water out coming in from the Quabbin. Um, you know, pesticides can be washed off um, rain um, ending up in Boston Harbor, Mass Bay, a local lake or river in your community. And one of the things that we noticed over the years is, you know, and I have a friend, by the way, who is a, a landscaper and longtime landscaper, um, who's not necessarily organic, but he's very cautious. And as he says, the problem with most homeowners is that if if a little bit works, well, then a lot must work better, right? And they so homeowners tend to overuse often a pesticide that they can buy at say one of the you know one of the garden centers or one of the big box stores just not understanding it whereas a, a, someone who's applying if they have to apply them or someone who's doing landscaping understands that a little bit better so the problem is if we use too much or if you use it and then it rains you end up with it um they can migrate into the groundwater end up end up in drinking water we are lucky i will say this right now because i i consider us the foresight of the people who built the Quabbin back in the 30s, uh, you know, I'd love to give them all a hug. Um, we protect the Quabbin Reservoir and Watertown is 100% water community <clears throat> with the MWA. So you're on our water. Um, it's protected by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of watershed protection. And we work with DCR to protect that land. And so you're not, we're not using pesticides. You're not getting that kind of stuff. There's no industry right around there. So we are very lucky to not have that in our drinking water, but it's not the same for everyone. Um, I'm kind of, as they said, also going to talk a little bit as we walk through about household hazardous waste in general. We're talking about pesticides, household, some of the other things besides pesticides. Um, and this is from collections. I've not, I've been involved in household hazardous waste collections for, I hate to say how long, but 30 plus years. And um, one of the things we've seen, and it, it's very interesting, it, it's demographic, it, it goes by demographics and, and types of communities and everything else. But the key things that we see um, that end up being thrown in the trash or dumped down the drain or poured out in a storm drain or, you know, our motor oil, paints and solvents, household cleaners, drain openers, uh, back to Debbie's comment about cleaning your drain and not using a drain opener uh, or plumber and pesticides. So, you know, again, those are the five biggest things that they, that, that, that um, are commonly not disposed of properly and end up uh, where they shouldn't. Um, and I also apologize. I speak very quickly. So uh, Debbie, maybe if somebody thinks I'm going too fast, please let me know. I just, I've been this way my whole life. So I just go. Um, so some of the, I just thought I'd sh throw some facts out there because it, it it's what I, it's why I do what I do. And, and some of the reasons that just, um, just sometimes think, oh my God, this is why we have to keep doing it. And we need lots of young people doing this. 43 states have water contaminated by pesticides. That's from the EPA. That's a, re um, a recent number. Um, 75% of U.S. households use pesticides regularly. Now, again, that could be for ants, that could be for weeds, that could be, you know, there are lots of reasons that, that people might use them both inside and outside. Um, among the most lawn, common lawn products, and I don't know if Jim mentioned that last time, are weed and feed that combine lawn fertilizer with herbicide. And so they're in the same bag, and so people are just tossing out this fertilizer in the lawn, but there's also an herbicide in that. And again, as I said, and then it, if it rains or someone waters their lawn, a lot of that will run off. Or, you know, if they've got kids playing on the lawn or pets. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I found interesting, and this was done several years ago now, but it was fascinating and telling for us is a joint study uh, done by Seattle Metro King County and the United States Geologic Survey tracked pesticides used by consumers in spring and fall, right? That tends to be mostly when people use them in the yards. And they compared that to pesticides detected in nearby lakes and found a direct correlation between the types and amounts used by the homeowners in that area 
to what they were finding in the water. So it, you know, a lot of pesticides are, are, you know, fluid. They will, they will, you know, they're, um, they don't bind onto the soils. And so when it rains, they're, they're, you know, or water, they're ending up in the local water supply or in your local ponds or where people fish, all kinds of things. Um, another thing and I'm, and uh, that always um, I find fascinating and a lot of, I have friends who are oncologists and we kind of have these conversations about the health effects of pesticides and, you know, the Silent Spring Institute compared habits and practices of women in areas of high breast cancer versus in areas of low and found that 65% of the women in the areas of the high incidence reported using professional lawn care services with 36 in the low where so they did find that um, people where you've got nicer lawns, you know, maybe not very dense urban areas, but, you know, nicer lawns, bigger lawns, bigger backyards where there's a lot of where they hire somebody and this stuff is being sprayed on, they had it at the, um, you know, and it's very hard as, and I'm sure the woman next month will explain this. It's hard to do a lot of correlations with the health. It's very hard to make those. And there's, you have to do this for years, but they were, these were some of their initial findings. Um, and again, you know, according to the New Hampshire DES, it's uh, someone we work closely with, American households throw about 15.5 pounds of hazardous materials in the trash every year. So there's a lot of stuff out there going into the environment, which is what we don't want, right? Um, and, you know, what do we do about it, as Deb said? So what what are our choices? And so with regard to pesticides and, and um, you know, we, we and I'm sure many, maybe many of you have heard this, it's called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Um, it's a way to deal with your yard and your house uh, pests with a minimum of pesticides and chemical fertilizers. And, and you're basically focusing on three steps, right? Preventing the problem in the first place, kind of like health issues, right? If you can prevent it, you don't have to, to cure it. Observing, you know, keeping an eye on it, whether it's, you know, the, the, the foundation of your house and termites, if you see something or a yard where you might see one bug and go, wait a minute, usually if there's one bug, there's more. Um, and inter intervention using complementary strategies. So it's kind of a three step. Um, and so prevention is 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 the best, right? And it it you know when you it, it it is also the way to have the strongest yard that will be able to stand up to pests and other drought and other things, right? So if you have good soil and drainage, right? If you don't, if you're trying to, you know, if you sometimes people, especially in urban areas, try to plant the lawn and they kind of throw some grass seed and hope it grows. And if there's you know if it's clay soil, if it's rocky like in uh, where I am in, in Jamaica Plain. Uh, I realized when I moved into this little house, um, they had dug all the rocks out to put the foundation in the 1880s, and they just put the rocks all in the yard. And if I didn't get rid of all those little stones, I wasn't going to have a very, uh, and I, I don't actually have a lawn, I have plants, flowers, but I wasn't going to, they weren't going to do well. So you really have to make sure that you prepare your soil and you have good soil and you have good loam and good drainage so that the water doesn't sit. Um, adequate spacing for plants, you know, so that they're not all crowded in and and making them more susceptible to bugs or other kinds of fungal diseases and other things, which you might see on roses and things. Buying the proper plant material, right? So buying pe pest resistant plants, um, you know, buy, choosing plants that make sense for our hardiness zone and rainfall. You know, we all, I'm a huge gardener. I am, as my friend who I told you was a landscaper always, always teases me, he goes, yeah, you're definitely not a landscaper. You're a gardener because I see this one plant that I have to have. I have to have this one plant. And, you know, so sometimes and landscapers don't. They have three or five of everything. Right. But not me. I've got my one. But, you know, I also have to make sure that that one plant makes sense for us. That it's unless I just want it to be an annual makes sense that it's the right zone, right. You know, hardiness. It's not this, you know, fragile little plant for our rainfall, for our winters. Right. Um, and so that's another thing that if you're if you're trying to, you know, have a healthy garden and then also this is and this has happened. I have to be very careful when, you know, garden centers do the best. But when they have when you go to a big garden center and they have hundreds and hundreds of plants, you have to make sure that you're buying plants that don't have uninvited guests already. No weed seeds. No, you know, look under the leaves. You're looking for, you know, mites, whatever, all kinds of insects that can kind of sneak in. Um, and that's really important that you don't bring that home. Um, as, and as I said, the same, sometimes they have weeds in them and you don't want those because those can really take hold. And then finally, appropriate maintenance, like cleaning up the debris, you know, in the in the fall and even in the spring, cleaning up from around the plants so you don't have a lot of dead material that can attract bugs. Um, you mulch your plants, you know, in the summer and in the, in the, in the fall with organic matter. Don't over fertilize um, 
you know, that's the problem. If you really fertilize and you get this great, it looks so healthy and looks so happy, but it's, you've fed it too much and it doesn't have the strength for the, the long run. It doesn't have that slow release. So we really uh, look for slow release fertilizers. And then finally pulling weeds before they go to seed and spread. I have, we have a, a preponderance of, uh, it's called snake weed. And um, oh my gosh, I get it before it goes to flower. Cause if I can get it before it goes to flower, I'm all set. The flower and starts going around, I'm in trouble. Um, so those are the kind of things that when you're thinking about prevention, um, when you come in the house, <laughs> you know, for other pests, not plant pests, um, because I wanted to cover these things, you know, um, seal cracks, holes, you know, keep bugs and critters out. As I said, I have a house that was built in 1884 and it had the old stone foundation and we tried to seal it up the best we can because that's where, you know, whether it's mice or other bugs. Um, we actually had two baby opossums one time. I don't know how they got in my basement. I, it must have been a pretty big hole in the foundation and they came right up the cat door. Um, so, you know, sealing those things. Um, the other thing is that I, I noticed um, we had had a problem um, and saw it right away with uh, carpenter ants. And you could see, I'm looking at the old clabberts and leave one day and I'm like, oh, there's this like brown stuff on the on the clabberts. I'm like, that looks like, it almost looked like coal dust. And I'm like, that's not normal. And sure enough, we took off that one clabbered and though that was kind of the dust from the ant, the carpenter ants doing their thing. So we caught it before, you know, by keep, just kind of looking at the house, looking around your foundation, just keeping an eye on things, um, listening for critters, that kind of thing. Um, as far household cleaners, you know, clean things up as they as they go. Don't let spills set. You know, the the you don't need heavy duty nasty cleaners if you kind of uh, do things as they go. And one of the things that Debbie man, mentioned, and we can talk more if people have questions. But in the book that we have, and we have you know products that you can use that are not not non toxic or less toxic than kind of heavy duty cleaners uh, that have um, all kinds of chemicals in them. But there are now. I, the thing is, we are fortunately moving generally in the right direction as a society. There are uh, cleaners out there <clears throat> that are that you can buy. You don't have to make your own that are definitely less toxic or non-toxic. Um, and you've seen them. And we always say to people, look for, you know, if it says, you know, caution, warning or danger. You don't want danger. You prefer not to have warning. Sometimes caution is just, you know, watch your eyes, which is, you know, you, you need to read the label because, the you know, um, there are, you know, you could get hot pepper in your eyes and it would bother it. So, but pre preferably it says nothing, or if, if at least it says caution. And if you're buying those products then and reading the label, um, there are a lot less toxic products out there now for, for doing stuff around the house. Um, again, keep plant material a few, feet, a few feet from the foundation and outside walls to make it less inviting. The closer tree branches are and shrubs, if you're right up against the house, it's the perfect spot for, um, for bugs, just come right into your house. It, it keeps it moist, it keeps, you know, depending on the, what kind of siding you have. Um, and so there are those kind of things. And then in the house, using strainers and sinks to keep solids and hair from going down the drain and clogging it. Um, and you'll have less of an issue with clogged drains if you just kind of put some of these things into play. So trying Denise, to cover- Do you want to give an example before you go on about some of the things in the book that you uh, describe? Oh, sure, 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 sure. So yeah, so I mean, you know, a lot of people you probably know, well, we, I'll, I'll go to preventative. And that is, like I said, put a strainer in to keep hair. Don't pour grease down your drain. Do not, by the way, for us, not just yourself, do not put wipes. Do not flush wipes. If they say flushable, it, it's wrong. It's They're not flushable. They've never been flushable. They're not. <laughs> um, we have a lot of problems with that. Um, the other thing is, is that you, a vinegar is a great cleaner, right? I mean, you do have to be careful on certain uh, countertops. You can ask your countertop and install it at but vinegar with a it like four parts of um one part of vinegar to four parts of water works really well to clean windows clean surfaces um it's also vinegar is a bit of a disinfectant right um so and most of us don't unless somebody's really sick in the house most of us don't need to clean everything with bleach um you know a lot of people i think when you see commercials they try to convince you to <laughs> that you know the germs are going to get your family well you know Unless, as I say, you have someone who is very you know, compromised or whatever, we don't need to, to, to do that. Um, and even hospitals don't like to do that because the bleach isn't good to inhale and it's not good uh, for people's skin. Uh, baking soda, baking soda, salt and water make a really good paste if you have to scrub something. Um, so I guess, I don't know, Debbie, we can we can go through more. Or we can talk more later. But those are some of the um, some of the things that are good for for cleaners. Um, 
And as, as for, well, I'm going to get into uh, past outside. So Deb, maybe we'll be talking more about some other products when we get to those. Um, so as I said, we talked about observation, um, inspect your garden, look for pests, inspect the outside of your house. Intervention. Um, for plants, one of the ways, um, you know, is to, so if you've done the best you can to keep them out, but now you have pests. Um, they're a mechanical, right, which doesn't require any pesticide. There's biological, which are, you can buy uh, nematodes and other uh, critters that are beneficial to your garden. Ladybugs, you can buy ladybugs, they'll eat aphids. Um, physical, you can put tree collars on, tree bands, you can cover rows if you have that kind of yard. My yard's not that big. <laughs> uh, cultural, chemical, cultural, um, it, and this is, I won't go into this, but online you can find there are a lot of complementary plantings. So like marigolds next to, to certain, like next to tomatoes. The, the bugs don't like the uh, tomato hornworm doesn't like the smell of the marigolds. So if you plant better on your tomatoes, so there are ways, and, and then you have pretty flowers. So you have there there are these complementary um, plantings, and there are also plantings. And again, I won't go through them all, but you can look them up online if you if you Google that. But also, there are certain things you don't want to plant onions next to plants because let's say you plant them next to uh, I think it's beans or tomatoes. The onions give off um, oh, I forget what's the what's the term. Oh my God, can't think of it. Anyways, but it affects your tomatoes and you'll have sickly tomatoes and they're, you, and they're therefore more susceptible to, to pests. So there are definitely, when we say cultural, there are good plants to plant together and then there are some that we, sh that we shouldn't, you shouldn't plant next to each other. Um, and, and this is something then, so chemical, and when we say chemical, I don't mean pesticides, we mean things like, um, and you can make your own hot pepper, you know, spray if you want. Um, you, you can uh, mix, you know, um, uh, hot, like a hot pepper oil and or or a um, cayenne pepper in um, with like a like a what do you call it um, like a oil you know like um, sorry all of a sudden there's a loud noise outside um, um, and neem oil is something else you can buy um, so there are there are chemical things that you can buy. That are not pesticides that are that will help you. Um, I use a hot pepper wax uh, on my house plants sometimes when there are uh, pests. You know, when the small those little small white 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 mites that you get, and they are not going to they're not going to affect. Um, they're not like pesticides, so they're not affecting your health. Um, uh, so, and then going on with that, less toxic pest control. Uh, Bacillus laryngensis is out there. You can find products like that. We mentioned the hot pepper wax, horticultural oil. Um, a lot of people use these, landscapers use these. Let's say you have a fruit tree. You can spray it on the fruit tree right before the uh, buds come out when, let's say, you know, the, so that uh, it keeps the pests when you're, if you've got peaches or apples, it will protect the buds. Um, and then there's insecticidal soap, neem oil. Um, so there are, and actually, more recently, I added this peppermint to control critters. I um, I have four cats, so I don't know why we have mice, but we have mice occasionally. And um, working with some of the folks in my field, turns out that most furry critters like mice and squirrels and bulls do not like peppermint at all. And so I ordered pure peppermint oil and you put it on cotton balls and put it where like you say, you know, where your lines come up from the basement or whether um, and it works really well to keep mice away. So then you're not using, um, you know, uh, get, you know, traps or chemicals that, are, that might, people might be using. Um, you can also use um, like cinnamon or a cayenne. Maybe if there's this place where those little tiny ants come in, you can sprinkle that. I mean, obviously you don't want to go around your whole house with that, but let's say if there's a spot in the kitchen, uh, they don't like those. So they're, they're they, and those are, a lot of those suggestions are in the booklet and or on, on our, on our website. Um, so uh, the other thing is just reducing your use of household hazardous products, you know, besides, not in addition to pesticides, by non-toxic, like I said, or less toxic, um, you know, as I said, looking for caution or, or nothing, no warnings <laughs> would be the best, uh, um, you know, um, warning and, and danger are, are products that you don't want to buy. Buy only what you need so you don't have leftovers, especially with paint. Never mix products. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard you don't mix leach and uh, um, ammonia. Uh, they give off toxic fumes. Um, recycle paint. I I don't know Watertown's, but you know a lot of a lot of places 
even institutions will take your paint and they'll mix it and um, use water-based when you can and they'll mix it in that and they'll use it in their institutions. If left with house, if, if left with any household hazardous waste, um, try to take it back to your municipality's household hazardous waste collection if they have it. Um, also here I put some national chain stores will take back like the light bulbs with mercury, you know, the, the old compact fluorescents. They'll take the lithium ion batteries. Um, so there are, and I have some websites at the end, like Earth 911, uh, that you can look up and it will tell you, you know, you can put your zip code in and it will tell you where certain things can be taken back or recycled if you do have to buy products that are considered hazardous. Um, and I think some people don't even realize that there was a little bit of mercury in those old compact fluorescents and, you know, you throw them in the trash and then they break out and that's what's coming in and out of the landfill. Um, what could you do to protect yourself and the environment? As I said, minimize your pesticide and your household chemical use, change your habits, things like pulling weeds instead of spraying them, cleaning up spills, look for products that are labeled non-toxic, um, encourage household hazardous waste collection days. I know Debbie has, has encouraged um, the, I, or, you know, worked with the town of Watertown. Um, um, and it sounds like you've got other people there, Debbie, trying to, you know, use, you know, have pesticide free zones in the parks and the open space. Well, it's the same thing with household hazardous waste. Try to get them to do collection days or take back days. Um, encourage it at golf courses, colleges, or park, you know, those, those are places too that, that a lot of people are, have access to, you know, people golfing and they pick up the golf ball. Now it's on their hands. Um, it's always fascinating. One of the things that, um, we've read is that, um, there's concern, uh, and this just, is just an example of reminds me of golf courses is, uh, several baseball players, um, because baseball, some baseball stadiums, um, and I mean, professional <laughs> use pesticides to keep those the, the the outfield nice and green. And they have found, you know, and if you've ever watched the picture, they often lick their fingers. And every time they do, I'm like, oh, my God, you just touched the ball and God knows what was on it. And essentially, you know, they have found some levels of cancers in in baseball pitchers that all of a sudden that they're finding at higher levels. Um, and it's the same with, you know, if you're golfing at a golf course that uses pesticides and you're picking up the golf ball, presumably you're not licking your fingers, but you're still touching things and having lunch, whatever. Clean up after your pets. You know, that's the thing so that the waste doesn't go to, to, to you know, local uh, lakes, streams, rivers. Don't dump, don't dump to storm drains. A lot of people change the oil and think they can just pour it down the drain. Um, no. Um, and I have this here. Don't drink bottled water in the under service area. Our water routinely gets an A plus from the EPA. Um, we have excellent water and um, it takes a lot of petroleum products to, to, uh, to manufacture those bottles and now you've got some now you've got you know uh, plastic in the environment so that's my that's my pitch for us and for not drinking bottled water um so i have some websites here um there are more i'm always happy to send people things um i guess i actually didn't put my did i i guess i didn't put my mine up here debbie sorry about that um but but uh, the MWA. So for more information on us um, to get to our booklet, um, um, to get to all kinds of reports we do, as well as the quality of our drinking water, um, all of that is at, M uh, at our website, which is www.mwa.com. Um, UMass has great fact sheets on integrated pest management. Um, so does UConn here for um, IPM. Uh, integrated pest management. I mentioned you Earth 911 has a lot of information on how and where to recycle common items, household items. Um, maybe Jim mentioned this last week. There's organiclandcare.net. Uh, Washington Toxics um, uh, has some really good information um, on just on general household hazardous waste. Beyondpesticides.org has a lot of information on reducing pesticides, on alternative products. Um, and the EPA does also, they have a lot on household hazardous waste. Um, um, and that's epa.gov, uh, HW household hazardous waste. And then finally, the um, yeah, they're called Safer Choices. Um, so those are some websites out there that we've used, that we trust, that have some good information. Um, as I said, we're always, uh, you know, willing to help if we've got the information. Um, I thought, uh, I mentioned to Debbie before I, stop and take questions. And I'm sorry, I have no idea what time it is. You've got um, plenty of time. Okay. Um, I do, I do. And I, and there's, 
other things people have questions or want to cover, but I did want to mention because you keep reading it, people are probably reading a lot in the news about PFAS and PFAS, the per floor alcohol compounds or per, per, um, and so I thought, well, maybe you'll have questions. So I would mention it. It's not really uh, pesticide or household hazardous waste. It's you probably have read that these compounds and there's there's a lot of them, but there are six that are of concern. Uh, the EPA is is uh, now set a water quality standard for drinking water for six of them. Um, they're in like Teflon pans, fire retardants. They are ev everywhere, unfortunately. Um, I think people, you know, there are companies like the, I want to say um, DuPont. Some of the chemical companies are promising to phase them out, um, but they are everywhere. I'm sure you've read about them. We do not, and you can see this on our website if you go um, to the pendrive.com and look, but I just wanted to say that based on our current sampling, so we didn't we didn't have to start sampling for them under the EPA's regulations until um, 2021, but we started sampling and looking for them in our drinking water in 2019. Uh, and based on the sampling, which the data is on our website, um, we we do not have a problem with PFAS or PFAS or any of the six compounds or any um, that we can sample for. Um, we are the samples are routinely either um, well they're essentially below the detection limit, which you know, uh, some of you probably know, that's the limit of which the equipment can detect, right? And it's um, the um, the federal limit is four, the new federal limit is four parts per trillion. So it would, you know, so when I say non-detect, it would have to be below that because, you know, the equipment doesn't mean there's nothing there, but it means it's such a small, such a trace amount or nothing. It could be nothing that, that you can't see it. Um, and certainly not with the equipment. And we certainly uh, don't even come close to that limit. Uh, mass, that's that's per uh, per compound. Mass DEP is a combined for the six of 20 part per trillion. Um, but as I said, we don't approach either of those limits, the four or the 20. Um, and um, so I just thought because you probably read about that and I do know that Watertown is on our water 100%. There are a lot of communities that are either not on our water, have their own water supply, um, or there are communities that are partially supplied, but Watertown is 100% supplied by us. Um, we also do sample it in the wastewater, obviously, you know, to try to figure out if if there's some protections that need to be there. Right now, there's they're just coming up with treatment for it more in drinking water. Um, but we also, fortunately, are not seeing a ton in our wastewater, but we'll keep an eye on it because um, we don't want it in the harbor either. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, and I don't know, Deb, like I said, we I mentioned the booklet. Um, is there something else, Debbie, that you think... Um, do you want to talk about the wastewater uh, during the pandemic? You were going to mention that. That's right. That's right. If people are interested, probably maybe read about this in the Globe too. I think it's really cool. Um, we um, were working with a, a MIT, at the time, MIT startup. Now they're, they're not so much a startup. Um, actually started by two women, which is really cool. Um, and they came to us and said, look, we've got uh, a system for, we think, for testing viruses. And in this case, the COVID, but others, uh, the SARS virus in wastewater. And, you know, the thing about um, testing this in wastewater is that it's a good predictor of what's gonna, going to happen. So because you see it in people's, in, in the wastewater, in excrement, <laughs> before you actually often feel sim symptoms, right? And so it was a good way, one, for them to test it and for us to be able to be involved and see, kind of, you know, be able to inform decisions being made during COVID, right? About lockdowns and mask wearing and all this other stuff. At least we'd have the information and and um called by what. And it it worked. I mean it worked and we've been participating and we are still participating. Um it it most likely we can use this technology for future viruses. Um and it's fascinating. You know, the wastewater is tested and you can really, you really can see the correlation about 10 days. You know, if it starts to go up in about 10 days, you're gonna see it people are going to be seeing it physically. You know, you're going to see more hospital visits, more uh, more at the time, unfortunately, deaths and things. So it was pretty cool. And um, there's information also on our website <laughs> about that. Um, and it's just, it's been really cool to be involved. And as I said, it's, 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 it really is something that now we're going to be able to use for other viruses and other things. Um, and um, in fact, you know, interestingly enough, not that this has anything to do with pesticides or household hazardous waste, but we can even use wastewater to find out where there's high, you can actually test for 
drugs, illicit drugs, if you will, uh, in the wastewater and try to target areas perhaps that where, you know, for social programs and others where there might be uh, significantly higher uh, drug waste in the in the wastewater. So wastewater is is fascinating. Um, you know, I'm 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 a nerd, admittedly, but it's so it can tell you so much. Um, so it's been kind of cool to be in, involved in that. And now, actually, on my energy hat, we're looking at uh, working with a German company uh, extracting heat from the wastewater, so that we're not using fossil fuels. Um, so there's all kinds of cool stuff with uh, wastewater. So what are the concerns of pesticide use to the MWRA? Is it uh, affecting the, our water supply or could it using these pesticides? So it's it's not, like I said, it is it is not because of the way we protect the quabbin. Um, it is more of an, uh, it's, for us, it would be more of an issue on the wastewater side, right? Because we're, you know, we've spent billions of dollars to build Deer Island and bring Boston Harbor back to something that's more, you know, that's a healthy ecosystem, right? Um, and if um, if the pesticides are getting, you know, people are dis or household hazardous waste for that matter. If this stuff is being discharged, right? Um, you are you could affect local sewers, but you could also then affect the harbor. And we, you know, finding, you know, years ago, and it's gotten better. Um, I mean, you get better. But years ago, for example, you were finding um, we were finding cancerous lesions in flounder. I mean, so there are things where even if you're not you could be affecting the re reproductive systems in these organisms, right? So it's not even just killing them. Re they might not reproduce. They might be smaller. They might not be as healthy. And, you know, that's, it's more of a harbor issue for us because our drinking water is so well protected. You know, now, that doesn't mean that your local streams, and you, you also want to protect those. But for us, it's more of a wastewater issue um, because we, we protect it so much. Um, you know, so we don't want people to use it for other reasons, but ours is the quabbin is incredibly well protected. And can you uh, talk about some of the things in your book, uh, how to control some pests and um, just organically? I think there are some ex uh, examples in the book about um, you know, moss and uh, the different type of caterpillars and mosquitoes are especially big or, or anything like that. Can you talk about that? And yeah, what kind uh, of yeah, 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 have? yes. <laughs> Well, I think for mosquitoes, honestly, what we, you know, as in this book that we did uh, several years ago and, and have not been able to do another one, but, you know, we, um, mosquitoes, I will say, are definitely, you know, back to that, the table I had, the kind of prevention, you know, don't, don't have stand, of course, it depends on where you live. If you live in the middle of a swamp, there's, you know, or, or near a wetland, but, you know, don't have a lot of standing water around. A lot of people, you know, don't, don't leave a bucket in the yard, don't have, um, because if you have standing water, you will have more mosquitoes. Um, I, I think that, um, a lot of people, um, there are a lot more mechanical ways now of dealing with mosquitoes. If you have a deck or, a, you know, if you're outside, um, you don't, spraying doesn't really do a lot because it only takes care of it for, you know, an hour. I mean, it doesn't really, and, and if you're spraying for them, um, then you're also ingesting or inhaling that. Um, as for other things, like I said, like, um, uh, insects that crawl but don't fly, that's putting the collars around trees or plants, um, slugs, you know, it's great to use diatomaceous earth or or other things like that. I know a lot of people used to, the old days, they collect, you know, they put beer out and they would funk crawl into the beer, which they do and they drown. But because they, the way their bodies work, if you put diatomaceous earth, which, you know, is like the crushed shells almost, right? It's a, it's a crushed uh, um, permanent, put them around your plants. Um, it basically, they can't, they, when they crawl through it, it basically destroys their body. It's like kind of crawling over glass. So that diatomaceous earth has always been something good for the garden. Um, now, granted, if it rains a lot, you're gonna have to put it, you know, more back, but it's, it's a great way to deal with things like slugs without any, um, you know, using a hazardous material. Um, there are traps. Traps are great. Um, if you've got, um, you know, um, trying to think of like a, a, a good example of uh, trap traps. Um, a lot of times, like I said, you put, you well, we mentioned um, the diatomaceous earth, we mentioned uh, beer, um, let's see. Sometimes if the, if the bugs are large enough, you just pick them off. Um, uh, Bacillus lurengensis I mentioned is, is, is a uh, biological control and works well um, for things like uh, tent caterpillars, gypsy moth, cabbage bugs, tomato hornworms. Um, 
or a capsule oil, which I mentioned, you use dormant oil. You do that before it buds out, and that will protect the buds, especially if you have fruit trees. Um, I think of some other things that I'm not um, trying to think of some other good examples. And, and again, a lot of times just prevention, having you know healthy plants, having the right soil, don't overwater. Um, you know, you've got then you have standing water, then you uh, invited the pests. Have ladybugs. You can order ladybugs. They eat aphids. Obviously, they fly. But if there's enough, if you have insects in your garden, they're going to eat the, you know, um, having things, you know, having just having healthy plants. Can you talk about uh, uh, things like fabric softeners and detergents, things like that, uh, that uh, you mentioned in the um, in the in the book? Yeah. So I um, so a lot of things like like, you know, we're we're another thing that we, I didn't talk about that um, affects particularly wastewater um, it can also affect water again though ours is very well protected but other other water sources um, you know high phosphorus high nitrogen so those are things that you might not think are well they don't, they're not toxic they're not like DDT but um, laundry detergent some laundry detergents um, and, and things have high phosphorus and high phosphorus um, when you end up with a lot of nutrients, which is something that we are current, that we've had to watch at the wastewater treatment plant for years, the EPA is kind of danced around regulating, um, but, or fertilizers, for example, like I said, with high nitrogen, that's why you want to slow release, because you don't want to overload, not just your garden, but you don't over, want to overload a water source or, or the wastewater source with, um, any water source with high nutrients, because you end up, um, you know, getting algal blooms, toxic algal blooms, or just algal blooms that suck the oxygen out of the water. And then you've got a very unhealthy environment. You, you know, fish can't, you, you need oxygen in the water. As these things, um, you know, whether you get um, algal, like I said, algal blooms or other blooms, invasive species, invasive weeds in the water, then they die off and they they call that bio uh, biochemical oxygen demand. As they die, they suck the oxygen out of the water. Um, and now you've got that that's not available for fish. And so things certain like like high phosphorus laundry detergents or 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 like washing your dish type detergents. I mean, there are a lot of alternatives out there now. They're definitely um, much more so than there were years ago. Um, uh, in terms of like you, you mentioned fabric softeners, but that reminded me, Deb, of like um, and it's less of an air. It's less of a water issue in air. But one of the things that, you know, a lot of people. Um, like air fresheners, and um, you know they, they don't really get the they don't they don't really freshen the air. They don't really take the odor out of the air. They basically mask the smell. Um, but a lot of them um, adhere to receptors like in your nose or whatever. And um, a lot of people have chemical sensitivities or other issues with that and their irritants. And so, like things like air fresheners, really, you know, um, are not are not the best for indoor air. A little different, not water, but but. We do cover that in the book just because, you know, people do tend to think of those as household products. Um, I don't know. How's that? Can you, can you suggest some alternatives that people can use um, for in their laundry? Um, well, is that, how do you mean alternatives? Like, I mean, uh, um, I, you know, as I said, you can buy low phosphorus detergents. Um, and that's probably, you know, in terms of alternatives, that's really the best, you know, and, and people... Part of the problem is you do need to look at the label, right? You need to know. Um, some of them will say no phosphorus. Some of them will, will or list no scents or no, you know. Um, but I wouldn't. I mean, like, I'm, and and also our our water is um, our water is such um, that you don't really generally need fabric softeners. You know, you typically people typically need those with hard water. We do not have hard water. We have soft water, so you typically don't need to you don't need to waste the money on fabric softeners. You mentioned um, in the book about um, uh, using baking soda, uh, half mm -hmm. a cup of baking soda for fabric softener. Does that really work? It does. It does. I mean, I, but again, you almost don't need it <laughs> with our water. Um, you know, but if someone, I guess, isn't isn't using our water, yes, it does. It does work. Baking soda is kind of a wonderful product for, like I said, cleaning. You can make a paste with it. Um, it works in the, you know, a lot of people we run their dishwasher empty once every now and then, maybe, you know, every six months with, um, you know, with a little bit of um, either vinegar or, or the baking soda, not both, um, to kind of freshen it up and kind of, you know, get out any um, lingering odors. Um, and, and as I said, you, yeah, and it works well as a, like a scrub, like a paste, like I use it in a shower. I don't use a, I don't tend to use like a, 
I don't want to, I hate using product names, but you know, like a scrubby, one of those things, like a, you know, caustic scrub. I tend to just mix a paste of, of baking soda and water um, with a sponge or a brush. Um, and that's just as good as uh, um, some of those scrubs. You also mentioned to get rid of grease in the laundry. You, you can use a half a cup of borax in the in the wash water. Does that work? It it does. It does. I mean, well, I should say, it, I have never had to use it. I I have been told that you. I should say that. I should say that way. I've been told it 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 works. I have not had to use it myself. Um, so, um, what about clogs in the drain? What do you what do you recommend? Oh, but for that? I'll back up a little bit. I will say that dish detergent works as a great remover on your clothes for if you get a little bit of grease when you're cooking if you immediately put again not using high phosphate dish detergent but whatever you use to wash your dishes that's a really oftentimes a really good grease remover if you get it right away my husband has a habit of i don't know everything he wears when he cooks and he ends up with and if you just scrub a little bit of that because it you know um right away i'm sorry go ahead just dawn to me okay all right. What about uh, clogs in the drain? Say if you have a clog in the kitchen sink or the bathtub sink, what do you do about it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure which of our suggestions you use, but a lot of times baking soda and then either baking soda and boiling water, right? You pour down boiling water might work. Um, um, mechanical means of snakes or other things to, to get, uh, to get the drain cleaned. Um, drain cleaner is besides being incredibly caustic, it's really bad for your drains. Um, it's corrosive because that's what it's meant to do. Um, and is not, it's not good for your plumbing basically. Um, so we, I've often done baking soda down the drain. It's important. Like I said, if, if you can prevent it, you know, with strainers to keep the hair out. Um, I have very thick hair. I have a lot of hair. So is my daughter, um, you know, strainers and everyone clean them out regularly. Um, I do actually pour uh, boiling water periodically down the drains, not when they're clogged, just, you know, besides cleaning them out with keeping a strainer, um, don't pour grease down the drain. Um, for, uh, definitely for most clogs, prevention's the best if you can. What about for ants? What do you, what, what, what do people, cause we're gonna, whereas we come into spring, you see a lot of people have big ants in their houses. What can they do about that? Right. right. I, I, um, you know, I think that the best thing really is, um, and, it, and again, it depends on how many you have and what kind they are and where they are, <laughs> you know, but if you have, like I said, sometimes like, I, I know my mother-in-law at the Cape used to have in the kitchen, they would come up right behind the sink and there was like a little strip and, you know, sealing is important, right? If you can seal it, like, you know, put caulking or whatever is the best, but if you've got a little problem, um, things like, um, cayenne. Um, oh my gosh. Um, going out of my head. Um, cayenne is the one I'm thinking of, but there's, um, oh, cloves, um, cloves, which also smell good. Um, and, and sealing up, like I said, and keeping the plants outside away from the house. Cause if you have plants up against the house, you are more likely to get ants coming in because it keeps the house moisture and also gives them a, a vehicle to, to be able to come in the house. And the Beyond Pesticides website uh, probably gives you a lot, a lot more. I'm, I'm trying to think of them as we go, but um, that's definitely a website where you could find a lot of alternatives or in the book. Okay. But again, if you had a lot of ants or if you had this huge area, you're not going to want to spread <laughs> cayenne or or cloves in a large area. That's, that's the thing. Um, so it really, you know, I don't want to, anyone to think, you know, Pollyanna will just like spread all our herbs around and we'll all be fine. Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are certain situations for it. There are times when, you know, again, maybe you have to deal with what's going on on, on outside and that's why they're getting in. Um, so it's kind of not a one size fits all type, type of a solution. It's really looking at what the cause is in the first place. Are mothballs safe or is there, are there alternatives that one can use? Um, th that is one I honestly would love to be able to answer for you. Um, I don't really have a great answer. It's one of the things that we've looked at. I have looked at for years. Mothballs are, naphthalene is a chemical. It's a chemical. It is a respiratory, can be a respiratory irritant. And so I, it's not good to be inhaling mothballs. Um, and, but 
you know, cedar, people will say cedar, but I have also found that um, cedar is, is good to keep them away, but not, but if you somehow have an infestation, putting cedar in will not get rid of them. It's the kind of, it's more of a preventative. Um, so I, that is about the best answer I have. That is one that's kind of bedeviled us. Okay. And I think anything else? Uh, did you have other slides that you wanted to share? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's not. I think that's, yep. No, I think that's it. Okay, great. Um, All right. So we're going to open it up to questions. Um, okay. If you can please put any questions you might have in the chat, uh, and then I can read them into the uh, into the program, and, um, and then Denise can answer them. So we're opening up for questions right now. So please feel free to ask questions and... Um, and we'll see what we can do. And uh, Denise will do her best answer. Give a few minutes for people to write in questions in. Oh, it's fine. And as I, as I said, if people have, I mean, it's, you know, hard to know exactly what everybody's interested in, but if people have follow up questions or they're thinking of something, they're, um, I guess, Deb, I guess I could, I guess, can I put in my, can I? You can in the chat. Yeah, here we go. Um, my email. There we go. That work? Make sure I spelled it right. Yes. Um, so, you know, if, you know, if there are, and, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, these are some tips for homeowners, right? For household hazardous waste and pesticides and why we care. Like you said, why does it matter? Um, but but as I said, people might be interested in the biobot stuff or the PFAS or other water quality sampling that we do or harbor sampling that we do. And that's all on our website. And I can always, if someone can't find it, I can always point them um, to it. There's a lot of interesting uh, information. We do a ton with energy now because um, water, uh, Water and wastewater uh, treatment is a very, as one might guess, a very high energy intensive use. Um, and so nationally, they estimate that water and wastewater plants use about 4% of the, the energy, which may not sound like a lot, but it is when you're thinking about national, you know, percentage being 4% of the total. So, um, I don't know. Um, Do you want me to so read them? I'll, I'll yeah. read the question. Um, uh, you go ahead because you want it on okay. the record. The Masons uh, landscapers I hired seeded my backyard with blue colored grass seed. I'm worried that the coating is toxic. Can you please give a give us a um, uh, oh. comments? You know what? I have no idea. I actually don't know because I don't know what the coating is. I know what you're talking about, and I could find out. <laughs> um, I could easily find out um, and respond. Um, I'm wondering, um, Debbie, what's the best way to answer? Um, because I can, I, you know, I can, I can find out, but I don't know that answer. Okay. Well, then, uh, uh, if uh, uh, it's a Scott product, yeah. It? it well, what if I could see the label? <laughs> you have the label. Um, this is from Kathy Button. Uh, Kathy, do you have the label uh, that you can uh, give uh, Denise more information? If not, I can. Um, I can look it up. I just. I don't want to do it now while everybody's on, but I'd be happy to um if if it's a way I can answer you, Debbie, and get no. Oh, oh okay. that's okay. through the bag way. Oh well. I don't blame you. I understand. And I know I do know what you're talking about. And I don't, I unfortunately don't know. Um, I don't know. Um I'm wondering, Debbie, what's the best way? Because I could definitely we can, we can get that we can get that uh information uh okay, to her. okay. Um, I've, I've, while we're waiting for more questions, do you want to comment? Uh, one of the things that Jim Agabitas talked about, and you also follow, you, you talk about this in the book about healthy lawns without pesticides. Uh, one yeah. of the things uh, that you, a bunch of things you you recommend is mowing high, leaving grass approximately three to two to three inches high, watering right. frequently, one inch of water uh, once per week, leave yes. some grass clippings on the, on the lawn, sprinkle yeah. some seed over bare or thin patches in the fall. Maintain a high pH of around 6.8 in your lawn. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about controlled grubs, which can cause brown spots on your lawn using beneficial nematoids, microscopic soil worms, rather than chemical pesticides. 
Beneficial yeah. uh, nematoids can be ordered from gardening supply catalogs and organic gardening catalogs. Can you talk more about that and why you mentioned that in there? The, all of those things are just the nematodes <laughs> or just in general. Yeah, talk about just in general. What, okay. what, what, yes. Why, you, why you, you bring said, that up? Why you think it's important? And then well, a little bit about the nematodes, if you can. I think, I think it's really important. And I did, you know, I've had that slide with that information. And I thought, well, Jim probably talked about all that last time. So I'll take it out. I, it's really important because honestly, like I said earlier, one of the biggest uh, pesticide slash herbicide use we see is herbicide is pesticide. Um, is the weed and feed, right? Or is the is the lawn stuff? I mean, people are obsessed with their lawns. As I told you, I don't have one. I have, but a lot of people want these beautiful lawns and the way to get them often um, perfect without a single weed and not a single insect is to, you know, just cover them with the, the herbicides um, and over fertilize. And, but then the problem with that is not only now that you have all this excess in the environment running off, you know, or kids playing on the lawn or dogs or whatever, but you also... Um, you're also creating a grass that isn't going to survive tough times, you know, like like drought um, and other things. And so, <clears throat> but it's it's lawns are one of the biggest sources of um, herbicides, pesticides that end up in the environment because people just overuse them. Um, and as I said to you before, also even if you know, generally professionals will apply less than a homeowner, but but again, you know, if it's sprayed, it's it's in, in the air, it's aerial. And now your neighbor who didn't want pesticides with the window open is inhaling. So I think the reason I think that I focused on lawns is, is really important because there are ways to get a healthy lawn without all of that, right? You may have the occasional weed, which you can pull, um, but um, in general, you know, the, um, uh, and as I said, I have a friend who's a landscaper and, and we talk about this a lot, um, you know, having it a little bit higher because it so it can withstand drought, so you're not get making it so short. Having the right soil, as I told you to start out with, um, all of that stuff is then you've got a really strong, healthy lawn that can survive drought. Might get a little brown with drought, but it'll come back. But you're also because you know it, you're not. It is one of the biggest sources of, of pesticides in in the environment, um, and oftentimes, right, you have. Um, Oh, I can talk about the, the gas powered leaf blowers one second. But the other problem is that lawn, what do people do? They sit on lawns, they play on lawns, they walk their dogs on lawns, right? So it's, 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 um, I think lawns are a huge source of, of the problem. And so um, to create a healthy lawn, I think we could really cut back, you know, on if we do the things that we said, like you said, only, you know, water to one inch depth, keep it two to three inches. Um, don't overfeed it, don't over fertilize it, uh, et cetera. Um, we could cut way back on the herbicide use. Um, and as I said, they hide them in those weed and feed, which drives me crazy. Um, uh, so that's that's one of the reasons why. And I, I, I assume Jim mentioned some of that, so I didn't, but yeah. it's yeah. really important because that's a lot of runoff. And then, and again, that ends up, some communities, you know, it, it could end up in the harbor, but others, it ends up in your either, you know, in your local, you know, if it goes down the storm drain, it ends up in the local ponds and streams and rivers, many of which, by the way, then could feed into Boston Harbor, right? Um, fortunately, again, not in our drinking water, that's out of Quabbin, but um, it's really important um, to, to, to try to avoid that. And, and you can have a healthy lawn without herbicides, absolutely. Can you talk about what a nematoid is and and uh, so, what, yes. so what yeah, they're a talking? beneficial right. They're a beneficial uh, you know uh, in, in, insect essentially that will um, they're parasitic on the um, on the grubs and so basically rather than using some chemical to kill the grubs, um, you're actually using a benefit. It's like having you know like the ladybugs eat the aphids, right? It's something beneficial or having you know. Um, in your lawn without using a chemical that will be a parasite on and and um, doing the doing the grub. Um, so the the idea the the big bug eating the little bug idea. Sort of yes yeah, if you will yeah. Um, and as I say, you can I you know I I interestingly enough I haven't well I don't again I don't have a lawn but I haven't heard friends of mine complain about grub about grubs lately but. If you have them, that is definitely one way to control it. And there are plenty of sites to be able to buy those from. Um, so what you're saying is you don't need to treat for grubs if you don't have the grubs? Right. That's right. Generally, yes. Yeah. 
And, and that's another one where if you keep an eye out and you see one, you see a, one brown spot and you don't have a dog because that's an issue I know. With it, you know, that's often what you'll, how you'll tell there's a grub there is that because they're eating the roots, right? And you'll have the brown spot. And so, um, you know, if you can stay ahead of it, you can actually kind of dig them out. But um, yes, that's exactly right. Um, and then you don't need to pre-treat for it if you don't have them. Um, I see here, somebody said, um, another problem in town is the use of gas-powered leaf blowers. I'm with you. Um, um, I, I will say we, as an authority, and, and I perhaps you encourage the town, we are really pushing, the state's actually pushing, but we as an authority are, are pushing, because as you might guess, we have a lot of facilities. We have water pump stations, wastewater pump stations. All of those have the, um, you know, the, 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 at least some grass around them and whatever. Um, we have easements, you know, we have all our water easements, you have all the water coming from the pavement. Um, we are switching to battery powered um, leaf blowers, lawnmowers, the products are out there. Um, they're quiet, they don't use fossil fuels, you know. Um, um, uh, I've worked really closely with the guy who runs the grounds for Walden Pond for DCR, and he is just a huge fan of all of these battery power. He's like, I can start earlier because I'm not waking up the neighbors. The, my staff love them because they're not loud and they don't emit fumes. So I, um, I, and I do know that there are communities where they're trying to pass, um, you know, ordinances where you just can't use them anymore. You've got a homeowners is not just the community, but homeowners will have to um, switch um, to, and there, and there are more and more coming out now. Um, but it's definitely, uh, I agree. They're just, offensive and loud and annoying and all they do is blow the stuff around anyways and but but yeah the gas power the um battery powered ones are are he says they were great they last um we did some tests with our grounds crews and they were excited about it they are a little bit more expensive but for us um as an authority we are now you know we don't just take the cost but we really do try to take into account the cost the social cost of carbon right and if we're not using gas powered we are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and we put a dollar amount on that and we factor that into the cost. Yeah. Other questions, folks, uh, please put through your questions in the chat. And I will, Debbie, I mean, I will, I will look up the Scott issue, the, the grass seed and see, look at the label. I just, and I, I'll get back to you. And I assume okay. you, you have a way to, Okay. Um, you want to talk while we're waiting for people to uh, put questions in. Um, what about chlorine bleach? Um, you talked a little bit about it, but um, you know what? What alternatives can people use instead of bleach? Okay, that's a good question. Um, well, you mentioned, you mentioned something guess, in, in the book about it. I guess it depends on what. I guess it depends on what you're using it for. Are you using it in the laundry? Are you using um, using yeah. laundry, they they use it for different reasons. Um, what what alternatives can people use? Because um, I don't I don't use any bleach. Yeah, so I don't. I mean, obviously, depending on on what the issue is. Um, actually, a lot of washing machines now have actually a whitening. They have a, a setting for whitening. Um, I, I you guess mentioned hydrogen peroxide a, a bit in here. I, if you wanted to talk about yeah, that, yeah, you can use that. I, I you can definitely, yeah. I'm trying to think. I was trying to think of completely not because I mean, you, hydrogen peroxide is definitely less toxic and better for the environment. It is obviously you could still it is still a bit a bit corrosive. Um, um, as I said, for cleaning, I you know vinegar is a disinfectant. So unless as, as I said, if you're not doing clothing, um, you know for any cleaning around the house. Um, Vinegar for you know four parts parts of water to one part of vinegar um, is uh, as is lemon juice, but again you um, and lemon juice actually will work um, on stains for clothing. Um, and I I think you know I oh. there are also there are now uh, alternatives non bleach alternatives that are like the oxycleans that are oxidizers that are not uh, as corrosive as bleach. So in, you know, instead of having to use a you know um, um, a homemade product um, for in the laundry, looking for the oxy the oxidizers is a better is a better better for the environment than bleach. Okay, 
We have a question yeah. about what's the best timing for automatic sprinklers. I don't know if you know the answer to that, but well, I, I know I know a little bit about that uh, solely from a from a water use standpoint, right? Um, and the best time really is I assume that the um, she means to, when you have them run. Um, and the best time really is early morning, you know, like at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Um, is it, I think that's the absolute best. The other would be at dusk, but then you end up with water on, you know, that that from a from a non-evaporation standpoint that works, but you end up with water on your plants overnight, which isn't always the best. So truthfully, early, early morning before the sun gets really hot, so that your you know the and that's also when plants plants absorb are absorbing things more as they're coming to life in the morning and as the sun's coming up and the lights coming up and the sun's out um and and also having a rain timer would uh, yeah i don't have one my yard's not big enough but um from my friend the landscaper it drives me crazy when i drive by somebody's house and it's pouring down rain and their automatic sprinklers on. and there are there are sensors to put on uh, my my understanding is, and I, I that I that's as far as I'm going to go. But so that you're not, if it's if it's meant to come on, but it's pouring down rain, it will not come on. But yeah, early morning is really the best. Say five, six, seven, you know, before uh, before it gets hot, um, and that's best for the plants. And it's and it's generally and it's best for evaporation or lack, you know, so that it doesn't evaporate. You don't lose water. Do you do you want to talk about um uh your your pets? A lot of people you uh there's a lot of advertisements I see about uh flea and tick products on pets. Uh are they yeah. safe? Are there alternatives that you can recommend? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um a, a lot of them um the the safest, and now this is I'm I'm gonna tell you this is from talking to a, a vet. Uh, this is not my I'm not I'm not a vet, so I don't want to, you know, but, you know, because of my interest in reducing the stuff around the house and on the pets and on the animals, um, you know, for people who have uh, flea or tick problems and there's no need to treat them if you don't. Um, but if you do, uh, or especially cats, uh, you know, dogs, I guess, if you're walking in all kinds of places you would want, but is the kind of very targeted um, where you just put a drop on and it's kind of. Um, you know, anything that you're spraying all over them or whatever. Um, but you, you know, is, is from my understanding from the vet is, is safer than this, this kind of anything you're going to spray or have all over them. Um, you know, giving them, if they, if you have a mild infestation, you can give them a bath. That's another thing though. If they're in the house, you want to deal with that, you know, deal with the, um, um, and there are non-toxic products available, like products light, they're drawn to the light. It's like a, like a, you can plug it in and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I don't, I guess I don't want to say too much beyond that, not being a, a vet, but um, I know some of the older products where you used to put it all over your animals. It's not, it's not great for the animal, not great for you either. Um, so kind of limiting. Okay. Hey, uh, some things you talk about is uh, in the book is about cleaning furniture and that you don't need the, um, the sprays uh, you mentioned in here. Uh, one half a teaspoon of olive oil and half a cup of vinegar or lemon juice. Does that work? It does work. Yeah, it does. It does. And we, you know, I always say, just you know, be careful what furniture you got, you know, try test this. They always say, test a little bit out, but yeah, definitely just a little bit of that um, uh, together, especially the lemon juice and the, uh, and the oil work. Well, you don't need a lot. You just want a light coating. You don't want it to be greasy. Um, there are, there are again, I mean, again, one has to, you know, it's good to check. Actually, the EPA Safer Choice website, Deb, is a is a really good that one um, because there are there are more products than since this booklet came out. And again, we have not been able to do a new one um, where there are safer products coming out, right? That didn't exist when we did the booklet. And the EPA.gov Safer Choice, and I double checked to make sure that that um, is is still the website. That's um, they have a that you can actually search by product names, product types. Um, and they will give you a lot safer choices. So you can definitely make your at home, and that's and what you just said is fine, and what the booklet says is fine. And we we test to be so to answer your question, most of the stuff in this booklet we tested on our own homes, our own clothes, our own whatever. I didn't we didn't want to recommend things just because we read about them. Or so uh, I, I had a, a group of, work, of folks at work that tested most of these, um, or have used most of the products, but 
there are now more safer choice products out there and that epa.gov safer choice uh website is a good one for that you can search cosmetic yeah. products is another one you know um it's not, you know, it's not something you're using to clean your house, but there are a lot of chemicals in cosmetic products. Um, and the Safer Choice, I'm pretty sure that you can use that to even look for safer cosmetics, you know, shampoos and, um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, because there's an awful lot of stuff in there. I, I just um, put the um, the website for Safer Choice um, in the chat. So if you uh, are but, watching this, please, uh, uh, you can take that and, and do some research on that, that Denise yeah. is suggesting. Yeah, because it's, it's, you know, it's definitely good for, like I said, even with for cosmetics, it's, you know, um, it's amazing <laughs> how many chemicals are, uh, and things that maybe aren't good, especially if you're using it all the time, right? It's not like something you're using, you know, you're using shampoo every day or every other day or you're using something. Um, they, I, I, I did, as I said, use the website the other day and they, they, they have uh, better choices. Great. Anybody else have other questions? For Denise, well, there's a question in the end. So let's see. Um, is miracle Grow bad to use? Is there an alternative? Um, so it's not that it's bad. It's just that, again, it's not. It's 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 um, depending on, you know, ass assuming you mean just the regular miracle Grow. It's just that it's a, a faster. It's not the slow release fertilizer. Right. So it's not it's not necessarily bad for you or the environment. It's just that you're giving it you're fertilizing a plant and kind of giving it it's kind of like giving it too much cake <laughs> sort of balancing cake with broccoli let's say i don't know that's my example you know if it were a person you're you're um you you want you don't you know you don't want things to have too much of a good thing because you will weaken your plants and so and they will be more susceptible to fungus and insects so it's, it's not it's not that it's necessarily bad from a health standpoint or getting into the environment really because it's not used that way but you really do want to uh, look at slow release fertilizers um, for your plants whether they're house plants or garden plants what kind of alternatives would you recommend denise um well there's um a lot of them and it, it can you know be, think about what your plant needs what your soil is but you know there's a lot of plants made from seaweeds uh, and that kind of thing i mean i'm sorry a lot of plants uh, there's a lot of fertilizers um, and that is more of a natural and those are slower release and very low, you know, phosphorus and nitrogen to potassium. And I'm, I'm assuming that Jim talked about some of those things last week. Um, so I, I, I don't have a lot on that, but um, there are um, there, I'm trying to think of some of the other, you know, having, um, <clears throat> um, uh, well, a lot of people will have their home compost is good, right? If you have a composter, that's another way to get some of that back in the soil, kind of slow as, you know, um, but the definitely what you don't want is any really high nitrogen. And I forget which way the numbers go on the, you know, when you buy fertilizer, there's the three numbers. Um, but you don't want to have really, really, you don't want to have high anything, but you definitely don't want to have a high nitrogen because that's where you get the blast. And maybe you get a million flowers, but you're creating a, a weaker plant. So really looking at the label, but I know a lot of the seaweed um, or see, you know, um, I forget, I don't, like I said, I don't really want to name brands, but, um, you can find those at most garden stores. Um, and there are so lower, so lower numbers, you know, the nitrogen to phosphorus to. What about some of them are fish oils, I believe. Um, uh, some of them are, yeah, they're, they're like leftover from, you know, the, 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 the leftover from fish when, you know, for whatever is being used for eating. And then they've got the leftover fish. Um, yep, that works too. I mean, remember the pilgrims used lobsters in their gardens, <laughs> uh, which always blows my mind now, given what they cost. But yeah, um, a lot of that stuff they have uh, just, you know, you want that kind of slow release, not high nitrogen, because um, you're just one, you're going to end up with nitrogen, especially if it's outside nitrogen runoff. <clears throat> but you're also going to, you know, you're going to create a weaker plant in the long run. What does nitrogen do to the the atmosphere? Do you have any uh, comments on I, that? That's not the atmosphere, but it's a, it's a, it's because it's a nutrient. Um, it it um, it's like you know giving sugar to organisms, and so if you use the high nitrogen on your garden, and then it runs into the local pond or a local stream or anywhere, it's basically like sugar for the organisms, and you get you can get like 
al high algal blooms and stuff, which is not what you want, right? You don't want, um, it, it tends to feed or invasive plants and it, it um, you know, it's basically like giving them sugar. So now you get a bloom of this stuff that you don't want because it will suck the oxygen out of the water. So it's not so much an atmosphere thing as it's a water thing. Great. Okay, other questions? We have about uh, 14 more minutes if anybody has any other questions. And please type them in either the Q&A or the chat, either one. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, no. Maybe another minute or so. That's fine. And as I said, if anyone ever does or... I'm, of these websites, our websites, our website has links to things too. So um, we're um... that the hope it, it with uh, with all the with the series is uh, so people in uh, Watertown and surrounding communities uh, will uh, think seriously about not using these toxic chemicals on their um, on their grasses and to think about using healthier healthier choices. Yes. And um, hopefully maybe considering having some type of pesticide free areas where um, people voluntarily decide that they're just not going to put pesticides on their grass. And uh, so people and their neighbors can walk their dogs and, and walk their, and go with their children and, and uh, families um, in the community and not oh, yeah. be worried about this. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's the thing is, I know you have the uh, woman next time, but particularly children. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, when I, 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 I tease and I, you know, I buy as much organic produce as I can. And I don't use any, I don't, in my yard, we don't, we don't use any pesticides or anything, but I'm always like, I may be a lost cause because my mother knew nothing about this years ago and I've been eating fruit for years, but my daughter is not. And I'm sure the woman next time will tell you, but the health effects, and I didn't put a lot of the health effects in here other than I did talk a little bit about the, the Silent Spring Institute, um, but in children in particular, because they're growing like crazy and obviously their body weight to, you know, to the, um, to what you're ingesting, right. It's a, a lower body weight. And I just, I, or pets, I mean, it just, um, always blows my mind that, you know, people are letting these kids play on lawns that were sprayed on the day before, or their dog running around. But I'm like, I don't, I don't know how you don't understand that that's, you know, um, there has been some studies, again, not a direct relationship, but, um, the uh, between um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and for, uh, pesticides used on crops. Um, and um, anecdotally, I've talked to some friends who are oncologists who said that's definitely a theory out there. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, we're best, I mean, there's some things we can't control, but if you can control it, we, we can put with, as they say, control what you can. Um, I see somebody said, I'm in a condo and we got them to stop fertilizing the rest. That's great. And, and and definitely like if well between what Jim's got and I, I have we have more lawn stuff we can share with um um this person I think it's uh, Barb Seeger if I'm saying it right um but yeah I mean it's most decidedly the stuff that we said like I said keeping it mowed higher two to three inches only water then you know don't go out well they shouldn't water every day maybe they have a sprinkler system um you know, uh, slow release, if they're using any fertilizer, more of a natural or slow release fertilizer, you know, a lot of, <clears throat> um, in the, particularly in the fall, if you have a, what do they call those, a, um, oh my God, not a, like a composting mower, because, the, you know, leaving some of the leaves that are, if you can grind them up and leave them on the lawn, they provide the, the, the nutrients as they decay for, as they degrade for next year. Obviously you don't want them to be all over the lawn or they will, you know, but those are some things that go natural. And I'm sure you heard some things from uh, Jim last time, but that's great. Um, as I said, there are things we can control and there are things we can't and that we can, we should do the best we can. And I think uh, one of the websites you have up here, Beyond Pestless, has signs that say um, uh, pesticide free lawn. Yeah, yeah, it's a cute, I think it's a sign you can order from them or maybe print it out. It's a ladybug and it's yeah, pesticide free zone. Um, um, which is, you know, it, it, it is one of those things, the more that people see it, perhaps the more they think about it and think about their own lawn and their own or their own kind of building or whatever. And um, it, it kind of grows. <laughs> um, All right. Any other questions, any other comments? Um, so please feel free to put them either in the Q&A or the chat.
and I hope it was helpful. Sorry, there's so many things we could talk about. We could we could sit here all night. So I'm trying to trying to think of the things that might complement what Jim said and what the woman next time might uh, might say. But certainly, um, you know, we are we are a, we are a water and wastewater utility, but we are an environmental organization and trying to keep our drinking water safe and keep the harbor clean. And, um, you know, I think we're doing a good job, but it really helps when everybody's with us <laughs> doing their part. Well, it looks like there are no more questions. Denise, thank okay. you so much for your time. I we so appreciate these are such helpful slides. And uh, the I think there's a wealth of information in these uh, websites. Uh, so I, I thank you so much. And uh, we're getting a lot of positive thank yous in the chat. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. So well, that's great. Yes. Really appreciate it. And uh, next month, uh, please come back next month. Uh, sign up on the uh, library's website on May 18th at 20, uh, uh, and uh, at seven o'clock. We're going to have Sarah Evans. She should be extremely interesting. Uh, she's a uh, assistant professor at um, at Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and uh, she uh, is uh, very well versed in environmental medicine and public health. So we're going to learn a lot next month. And about what is the science uh, regarding pesticide use and what are the health concerns for pesticide use, especially for children. So thank yeah. you so much, Denise. And uh, thank we'll you guys for having all me. of you uh, next month for the third part of the series. And thank you for having me. Appreciate everybody's patience with my my speed talking. <laughs>